Okay. So you can just press that. Just arrows, right? Yep. Okay. So I think we'll get started. So I'm Dr. Sadakot. I don't know most of you guys are yet. <laughs> um, so I'm one of the ICU docs. Um, and so what we're going to do today is this is going to be for the most part, you know, helpful when you're on nights and you kind of get called to see patients, you know, like, holy crap, what the hell am I supposed to do? Um, so the beginning of the talk is going to be kind of going over some strategies about what do you do when you get a call about somebody who actually kind of sounds sick. You know, not just can you renew a medication, they're constipated, they're tired, they want an ambient, that stuff. That's not what I care about. Um, so we'll go over kind of some strategies about what to do when you get called about somebody who's ill. Um, and then we're, the, the majority of this is going to be actually just running through a bunch of cases about things that you see all the time and we'll, it's supposed to be interactive. So guys, don't be afraid of me, talk, um, and we'll kind of come up with what should we be doing for these people. Okay? So that's kind of what I said. So the overview, we're going to go over some general guidelines about what to do when you're evaluating somebody who's actually sick. Um, we'll do a bunch of different types of patients who are short of breath with some degree of respiratory failure, somebody's hypertensive, GI bleeding, and then altered mental status. And kind of come up with, you know, what are some things you got to be thinking about when you see these people. So critical illness, it's any disease process that causes significant physiologic instability, um, which can cause them to become disabled or dead uh, in minutes to hours. So these are my people, they're kind of sick. Um, a critically ill patient is at imminent risk of death, and you, you got to do the right stuff um, when you first see them to help figure out what's wrong and manage them. So not let them die. Um, so, just some general notes. You know, there's nearly always early signs before anybody knows um, that somebody is starting to get sick. Okay. Um, so, you know, for the person who has a GI bleed, they start to become more tachycardic. They may not have any signs of them having bleeding yet. They're just getting tacky. And maybe they drop their blood pressure a little bit. And you're trying to figure out what's wrong. And all of a sudden, they're sitting in a giant pool of blood. Um, you know, even for patients who are septic, right? So somebody who is septic, has pneumonia, um, there are plenty of early signs that if you're aware and kind of looking at it, you, you can pick up that this person is getting sick. Um, there is this encephalopathy of sepsis where people just start to get confused and not acting right. Um, it's really hard to get an idea about what somebody's urine output is doing on the, the floor. Um, but you know, their urine output starts to drop off. So there's different signs that are, are earlier before they really declare themselves that if you can pick up on it, that's the best time to start trying to manage it and treat them. Um, younger, healthier patients will have a heck of a lot more reserve. Right? So they're not going to crash until things are really bad. Um, and then you have to think about the fact also, you know, in the, we have a lot of oncology here. Um, the immunosuppressed patients, you know, they may not have the same types of responses that people who are immunocompetent may have. Um, okay, so for any patient, um, if you get a call and you think that they sounds like they're sick, go and just evaluate them. You know, don't, you know, in terms of when you're prioritizing, what do you need to do? If somebody actually calls and sounds like they're sick, go there. Um, if you can, and usually this doesn't take very long, I think it's really helpful to just take a quick look at the chart, you know, filter out all the nursing notes, just look at the provider notes and try to see, you know, why is this person here? Um, it just helps you to kind of have some type of framework for what, what's going on with the person and, and for the group. Um, and then honestly, the first thing that's really important, and this is something that you'll just get more and more comfortable with as you go, is just look at them. And how do they look? Do they look comfortable? Are they in distress? Are they able to speak to you? Are they acting normally? Um, if they are, then you can kind of let your guard down a little bit and take your time to figure out what's going on. Um, but it's when they don't look good that you kind of have to really like you know, release some adrenaline and start 
trying to think, okay, what is happening with this person now? So this is just kind of like, I found this table. I thought it was kind of helpful. You know, just to, again, when you just walk into the room, you get their vitals and just like, what do they look like? And it helps you to get an idea about, are they sick or not sick? You know, so the not critically ill patient, you walk in the room, they're like on their cell phone, talking to their friends. They don't really look, they look fine. Um, they're awake, they're talking to you, they're cooperative. Their breathing is normal, both in terms of rate and the pattern of breathing that they have. Their vitals are all stable. They're okay. You know, maybe they're in the hospital, so something, they're, they're sick. That's why they're admitted. But it's not somebody who looks like that they're critically ill. Um, that middle, the, the critically ill is kind of easy. Right? So it's kind of easy when you walk into a room and the patient is blue or mottled that this is not good. <laughs> right? So it's easy to get a sense about who's fine and who's really sick. It's starting to be like aware of the people in between. Right? And so the person who's just kind of sweaty, a little diaphoretic, um, maybe is a little bit confused, breathing a little bit on the heavier side, you know, that's the person who's, those are early signs that they're sick, that there's something going on. Um, in terms of vitals, if their respiratory rate is up, their heart rate is up, all of those should kind of put alarm bells in your head saying something's wrong, you're going to have to try to figure out what's happening. So the steps in terms of um, what you need to do, there's your initial assessment, so that's when you walk in, you take a look at the patient, talk to them briefly, get their vitals. Um, Based on that initial assessment, there's gonna be your immediate management that you have to do, um, figuring out what you need to do to monitor the patient. And then after you do that, so step one is just stabilize them, right? If there's something going on, try to figure out how do I stabilize them, and then you send off your tests, right? Your tests are not your priority right away. It takes time for that stuff to come back, right? It doesn't seem as now, it takes hours for labs to come back. Even your blood gas, you can see them draw it for some reason. You're still hitting refresh over and over again, waiting for the blood gas to result. So it takes time for that stuff. So that's not your priority. Priority is just get them stabilized first. Um, your ABCs, right? So we always talk about your ABCs. So airway, breathing, and circulation. Um, that goes along in terms of when you're first evaluating this person who looks like they're actually sick, what do you need to be doing? So like we said, in terms of airway, if they're talking to you, that part probably is okay, right? Um, I have a joke in the ICU that if I go to do an ICU consult and I have to wait for the patient to get out of the bathroom, then they're not coming to the ICU. They're fine. You know, that's the same kind of concept here. If they are able to speak to you, their airway is perfectly fine. Um, if they can't speak to you, that's definitely very concerning, right? You know, if they're having significant strider, um, if you don't hear anything, right? So a silent chest, where they just don't even look like they're moving any air, those are things to say, Okay, just take a step out of the room and call for anesthesia to the patient. Right? That's your, you made your assessment and your initial management is, wow, they're in real trouble. <laughs> Let's get somebody here to intubate this patient. Most of the time, not. So the different sounds that you may hear when you first walk into somebody's room. So if they're snoring, um, that's upper airway obstruction. So that's up here. Right? So sometimes you can try doing a jaw lift if they're kind of out of it and see if that helps kind of clear that sound. Um, you can put in an oral airway or a nasopharyngeal airway. So it's like the trumpet that goes down or just an oral airway. Um, if you hear gurgling, that's fluid sitting on top of their vocal cords. It's just the vocal cords are vibrating and making the gurgling sound. So that person you should try to suction and see if you can get that stuff out. Strider is obstruction by either a foreign body, so they choked on something, or stenosis. So we kind of classically think about it in terms of vocal cord edema after somebody's been extubated. Um, but depending on what's going on, that could be a lot of different things that could be causing that. Um, most of the time, is strider inspiratory or expiratory? Usually it's inspiratory, right? So inspiratory sounds. <coughs> That's right. Um, wheezing is usually expiratory, right? Um, so for Strider, you try to see if they're doing this, they're 
choked on something, so do a Heimlich and try to see if you can get it out. Um, but if they're really striderous, you know, there's, you guys know, what, what are some things you can try? If somebody has strider, but you don't think it's bad enough for them to be intubated, I mean, they're still trying to talk to you, but they're kind of like, <gasps> I don't know what's going on. Hmm? Yeah, so you can try racemic epi. Um, you can try giving some nebulizer treatments that help. So racemic epi is epinephrine nebulized and then breathe it in that way. To see if it's, if it's inflammation that you can try to vasoconstrict and get rid of that inflammation in the air. Um, wheezing, <laughs> it's just going to be give bronchodilators and see if that helps. Um, and like we said, if they're totally silent, uh, that's, you know, that's bad. Yeah. <laughs> Rarely is the case that you walk into, but if you see somebody just Call anesthesia and get the patient in there <laughs> if they can. Um, breathing. So, pattern of breathing is something that people don't really pay attention to a lot, to be honest. Uh, but it does help you in terms of trying to figure out what could be going on with the patient. And then the other part is just looking if they're like, if they're sucking in wind and their neck is just getting sucked in every single time they're taking a breath, that's not good. That's a lot of accessory muscles that they're using in terms of trying to breathe. Um, so if they have bradypnea, so that they're just breathing slowly, uh, you think about sedatives, you think about whether or not did they get narcotics, right? So give this patient Narcan, and that's the reason why they're breathing so slowly. Um, or are they just wobbly and stuff will happen? Some people have that for a lot of different reasons. Uh, tachypnea, so remember, tachypnea is not necessarily always just a lung problem. People get tachyptic because of acidosis. We see that all the time. So people who are getting septic, have a lactic acidosis, they're huffing and puffing. It's not because there's anything necessarily wrong with their lung. They could be septic from a pilo or a urine infection, but because of their lactic acidosis, they're huffing and puffing. Um, certain sympathomimetics, uh, an aspirin overdose, that's like for like medical boards. That's in the, the classic. Do you guys know what they have with an aspirin overdose? Yeah. Uh, that's um, and then chain stokes. So chain stokes, every now and then we see this. It's this kind of this pattern where they kind of breathe fast. We had a guy a couple of weeks ago in 4BW who eventually got integrated and went to the unit who uh, had an EF of less than 10% who was breathing like that. Um, so you see that in CHF and in brain injury. And then Kussmaul breathing, is again, somebody with a severe acidosis. It's classically, we associate that with DKA, um, but it's just Because <sighs> remember, when you're trying to blow off your carbon dioxide, you're doing that to try to compensate for your acidosis. Um, you can do it either by breathing fast or by breathing heavy. Those are your two different ways that you're gonna adjust your minute ventilation to try to compensate for whatever acidosis you have right now. And in circulatory, this is where you take a look at their vitals. If you see modeling, it's bad. Something very bad is going on. Usually they're septic. But if you take a look, you pull up the sheets, and you look at their legs, and they have that blue look of death. Um, that's not good. Uh, and you can feel pulses and see if they're bounding, if they feel normal. So if there's family there, if the nurses are there, which ideally they should be, if they're calling you saying, I need help, um, use them. Right? Especially in a patient who's actually sick, that patient is probably not going to give you all that much helpful information right now. Um, so if there's family there, if the nurses are there, try to figure out when did this start, what happened, you know, you've got a blood transfusion, and then you started getting really short of breath. Or, you know, try to get some idea about what, what, what happened. What am I walking into right now? Um, and most of the time, and this is where I was saying, if you can, take a quick look at the chart before you walk into that room. Right? Most of the time, if somebody comes into the hospital for this problem, their acute decompensation right now usually is related to that problem that they came in with. Right? So that initial knowing, kind of having some idea about why the heck they're in the hospital will really help you to get an idea about why. what do I need to think about? Because you always make up your differential about what are the different things that could be happening. But then what's going to be at the top of your differential? They came in with CHF and have a shorter breath. CHF, right? You don't forget about the other stuff, but it's probably that. And you can kind of, you know, when you're thinking about what am I going to try first, that's what you're going to try first. 
So I thought this was a pretty cool picture that I found somewhere. Um, so it kind of goes through just what we talked about. So there's your initial assessment, then there's the immediate management, how are we going to monitor the patient, and then your initial investigations. And so just like we said, so your initial assessment, get an idea about what their airway is like, their breathing, how are they breathing, what's the pattern, what do you hear, um, their circulation, what are their vitals, um, what's their color, do they look blue, um, and then they, they added this thing, disability, which is just trying to get an idea about what's their awareness, right? Are they acting normally? Are they confused? Are they completely attended? What's, where are they at in terms of their neurologic status? And then based on these things and whatever history you're able to get from either looking at the chart, talking to the family, talking to the nurses, your first thing is just, okay, what do I need to do right now to stabilize this person? We're gonna go through a bunch of different cases to kind of practice this. Um, and that may be, you know, do I need to intubate this person? Do I put them on BiPAP? Do I just give them more oxygen? Um, do I need to give them fluids? Do I need to give them something to get their blood pressure down? These are all the things that were initially, I need to do something to fix X, Y, and Z. Um, then you'll figure out, and for the most part, if somebody's actually kind of sick, the things in terms of monitoring that you're gonna do is get them on a monitor. <laughs> So get them on a continuous monitor, get a, a continuous pulse ox on the patient. Um, and then after we've done what we can to try to stabilize the situation, <clears throat> then we figure out what tests we need to get. Blood gas, blood, x-rays, CAT scans, whatever else we need to do. Okay? So it is usually kind of a reflex. If you come in, you see somebody, they look short of breath, well, let's get a chest x-ray, let's do this. You can get, you can put all, that stuff's all gonna happen, but your first step should be, what do we think is wrong? Is there something that I can do right now to actually make them better? And then figure out what tests I need to run. Because their tests take time. Okay, so just a quick thing, just to make sure that everybody kind of understands, just like a hack and sack, like what are our levels of care that are here and who do you call when you think somebody needs more care? Um, so one thing that I'll always say, this is as me right now as the step down doc, is uh, you know, the majority of patients, <clears throat> whatever is wrong initially, they're hypotensive. You do something and then they get better. And they don't really need to move anywhere, right? So if the nurse calls you, the blood pressure is 70 over 50, and you give them a fluid bolus, and you stop the diuretics, you get their labs, their labs are okay, the blood pressure comes back up, and you stop their antihypertensives, then they're fine. What are they doing with that? Um, but there's different levels. So if you think that the patient needs to get moved, this is just the, the four different places that we have. I don't think these doctors this one. Right. It's just to kind of just make sure. Like acute care is a general bed. You can't. It's plus or minus if you get telly or not. Unis based telly is a. It's a regular medical bed, but they have everybody's on a monitor that somebody on the unit is looking at, um, and they can actually handle a lot of drips. So you know the you can actually put people on steady dose dopamine on unit based telly. You can put people on cardine on unit based telly. <clears throat> um, the nurses can't titrate it. You have to put the orders to adjust the doses, but all those patients can actually just go to unit based telly. Uh, you get calls for that all the time. Our own cardine, you need to go to step down. No, you have to. Nitro, you can go to unit based telly. Um, so, step down is the way I think about it. I always tell people, like, the way I think about it is the right place. Just do it in your eyes. So, like, step down is for people who have, it may not be that they, you know, if they're hemodynamically unstable, but they don't need pressors, um, the continuous BiPAP, that's a big one that we take all the time. Um, if they are trached, but now they need a vent. So, if somebody's on just trach collar, that can go to the floor. But trach patient who needs the ventilator needs to come to step down. <clears throat> um, but the other two things is if they're just really complicated, right? The person who's in multi-organ failure or dysfunction, their renal function is getting worse, their blood pressure is low, we don't know if they're going to need dialysis soon, their breathing is kind of heavy, they're on 50% venti mass, every now and then you go on BiPAP, the nurses are like, I can't, I've been in this room for three hours, I, I can't take care of any of my other patients. But those are all reasons to say, you know what, maybe this patient needs a higher level of care. Because the, the step down is not just saying that they're sicker and they need to be in step down. Sometimes it can be also that just the level of nursing care is just too much for a regular floor. 
and they need to get moved to the step down where there's a little bit better windshield versus efficiency. Um, for that, we call 3488. That's the step down APIs. You have that one. But then if they're, you call the ICU, if you think that they're going to end up on a vent or they're intubated, um, or you think that they're going to need pressors or they're just really sick, then you just call 2179. Okay, so let's do some cases. And you're gonna see kind of a running theme where it's kind of the same thing over and over. <laughs> okay, so case number one. You're called to the bedside of an 80 year old man who the nurse states is having trouble breathing. You enter the room, he's clearly in distress and speaking only in short sentences to you. So your heart rate's already going. Right? Mm -hmm. Who's done night floor already? I heard you. Oh, second? No, nah, first years. Night, night. Okay, who's got night floor coming up? Okay. Nifl was fun. I remember I did all my training at Sinai. Nifl was uh, used to order all this food. <laughs> <laughs> There's all these good places in Manhattan that we would order. They had a it was a cookie place. Insanity cookies or something. Insomnia cookies. Yeah. We used to get those cookies in the middle of the night. Yeah. It was kind of a party. Um, okay. So this guy came in. He was admitted with CHF. So when you examine him, he's diaphoretic, he's tachypnic, his lungs, he's got rails bilaterally, he's tachycardic, his belly is soft, he's got a lot of edema, and his sat right now is 85 on two liters, so he's a little hypertensive, 180 over 110. What do you want to do? Any yeah, Lasix. Hmm? Lasix. Lasix, okay. What else can we try? Elevating the bypass. Lasix and bypass. Yeah, so you, you, you know, if he's really, because he looks like he's really huffing and puffing, right? Most likely he's sitting up like this, <sighs> sweating, right? Trying to put leads on, nothing sticky to him because he's too sweaty. Um, and he's huffing and puffing. So Lasix, BiPAP, that's good. Those are good starts. So we kind of said, right? This is like the picture to think about. So it's our initial assessment. What do we think is going on and what do we immediately need to do? Um, so initially, so again, remember, everything takes a little bit of time. So in the perfect world, the BiPAP is sitting right outside of the room. You roll it into the room. Before you do anything else, you just put them on BiPAP, and they're good. <laughs> and they go searching around the hospital to see where is there, an, <laughs> where is there a free BiPAP that we can use. Um, so initially, just put them on 100% oxygen, right? Um, they're here with CHF. It's not good for your heart to be hypoxic and to be struggling like this. So just make sure they're getting enough oxygen. So put them on a non-rebreather, that's fine. Uh, while you're getting calling respiratory to say, you need a BiPAP. Um, so BiPAP helps because it reduces his work of breathing. Um, it increases intrathoracic intra pressure. So what does that do to preload? Decreases it. decreases it, right? So if you increase your pressure within your chest, you're gonna decrease your preload. You get less volume coming back to this guy's poor heart. You can't push it forward. Um, and it helps when somebody who's in pulmonary edema. Um, you can push Lasix. How much you want to give? Five, ten, twenty. Look at the year. <laughs> I remember when I was a second year resident. My interns would, would you know, when we were on the liver service, he was like, "Can I give Tylenol?" I was like, "Yes." <laughs> so, I don't know. It's fine. Just go ahead and do it. So I don't make any assumptions. Um, yeah, push forty of Lasix and see. Um, you can, you know, nitro case to try. Remember, he was pretty hypertensive. He was one eighty over one hundred and ten. You can slap some nitro paste on him. It'll work pretty quickly to try to reduce his afterload, right? Because his poor heart, if you imagine, let's say his EF is 30, right? So he's in pulmonary edema. He's now trying to push against his afterload, which is his high blood pressure. So trying to reduce that, decrease how much volume is coming back to his chest, use the BiPAP to help do that, and push fluid out. All of those will hopefully help him to feel better. So you do all that, and it starts to look better. Are you done? Is there anything else that you have to do? Not, like, maybe to think about whether or not he needs that. But is there anything else you need to do in terms of figuring out, like, is there medically wise, not just in terms of where you have to be in the hospital? Just yeah, I mean, you can do that. But what's the other part? Why did this happen? He's in flash. So is it the flash because of the blood pressure? Is he having ischemia? Yeah, you know, so just to always think about, you know, try, it, it, there's the initial management, right? And then once we stabilize them, that was the step that picture. Once you stabilize them, then you have to go back and think about, well, what the hell happened? 
you, know, you talk to the nurses and they'll say he was perfectly fine. Nothing was going on. Um, you know, he, we thought he was going to get discharged tomorrow. And then all of a sudden he said, he grabbed this chest and said he couldn't breathe, right? It's a little bit different. You know, you're not going to get that initially. Initially, they're just going to be like, holy crap, this guy looks like ass. We need to do something. Um, so you figure out how to stabilize him. And then, but you have to take a minute and figure out, okay, now what, why did it happen? Did you eat dinner and somebody snuck him some Burger King and he had a lot of salt and it was just as simple as that? Or you take a look at his DKG and you find out that he's got new depression, so where he's having active ischemia and it's that you know something actually is somebody forgot to you know put him back on his products and just got stented two weeks ago and he just closed off his stent. You know, so that's where you have to once you stabilize, you take a minute and try to figure out what exactly happened that caused this to occur. Um, okay, so case number two. We call to the bedside of an ADO man who the nurse states is having trouble breathing. We enter the room and he's clearly in distress and speaking in short sentences. It sounds just like what we did before. So he's this guy though, he's admitted with the COPD exacerbation. He's also diaphoretic, went to Kipnik, but he doesn't have rails, he's diminished and he's wheezing all over the place. He's tachycardic, his belly is soft. His sat is also 85% of two meters. His blood pressure is also 180 over 110. So what are you gonna do for this guy? Okay. Ooh, blood gas. Bronchodilators for the wheezing. Yeah. So he's another one. So we always get a little bit nervous. We never want to leave people on 100% oxygen. But again, this is a guy who's struggling. He's hypoxic right now. You can put him on a non rebreather while you're waiting to do something else. And for him, you know, if he's really working hard and puffing and puffing, again, this is a situation where you'd say, maybe let's try some BiPAP and see if it helps with his work of breathing. It's not for pushing out fluid. This is really just to help with his work of breathing. Um, for the, all that wheezing, you can give him bronchodilators, albuterol, and atrovent and C. The blood pressure <clears throat> it's probably high just because he's in distress, right? Uh, and so you can just watch and see if it just starts to come down on its own. Most likely, if he's going to respond to the BiPAP or the treatments, he'll, he'll start to come down just to end not distress anymore. Um, same thing. So once we stabilize him, we need to figure out what else to do. So you want to just double check the orders, make sure that this guy who's here with COPD exacerbations is on standing bronchodilators. Nobody just left him with a, a PRN or the ER ordered their one-time albuterol treatment, and then you didn't realize, you thought they were ordered, but actually not, you didn't get anything. These are all things that happen. Um, make sure that they're on steroids. If they're really having such a severe COPD exacerbation, just make sure they're getting steroids. So, because this will come up, PO versus IV steroids, right? So what does the data say? Does anybody know? So they're the same, right? So it's true. So if you look at the data, the data says that oral prednisone versus IV prednisone, the IV solumedrol, there's no real difference. So pulmonologists, I can tell you that if they're really bad, give them IV steroids. <laughs> um, there's no data that goes along with that necessarily. Honestly, I really do believe that a lot of that data is looking at people who are relatively milder COPD exacerbations. If you look at people who are a lot worse, you know, baseline severe COPD, who now come in with a COPD exacerbation, um, who maybe have failed outpatient attempts, because usually as a pulmonologist, I've already tried this guy on steroids and outpatient. So if he comes in, he's been on 40 of prednisone for three days, don't just leave him on 40 of prednisone. All the data says that it's the same, the poor guy on IV steroids. Um, and then this is where, you know, I, I wouldn't wait to put this guy on bypass. You know, I put the nine breather on, get BiPAP, and put him on BiPAP if he's really in distress. Once he's on BiPAP, I would check his blood gas. Right? Um, if he looks that he's hypercapnic, CO2 levels are high, and his pH is low. Right? When I think about hypercapnia, I always people always tell me, oh, the CO2 is 60, but the pH is 7.4. Is that person really acutely hypercapnic? No. This is where they live, right? Most of my COPD patients just live there. That's what I'm normal for. Um, but if they look like that they're hypercapnic, then you're going to want to leave them on BiPAP, especially if it's working. Um, but that's if they, you, 
always remember that you still, you're going to probably one, transfer the patient at least step down. That's how I'm going to take this one. It looks like they're going to need to stay on it. Uh, and two, if their first blood gas doesn't look so great, you can make some changes with the BiPAP, but you got to um, repeat the gas and make sure it's going the right way. Right? For, for me, when I'm in step down or in the unit, I need to know, is the patient responding to BiPAP or not? Because if the initial gas is a piece of pH of 7.1 to 100, and just put them on BiPAP, hope for the best, you know, I don't know what the next gas is. Is it going to be 7.3 and you can just go to step down, or is it 6.9 and he needs to be intubated? So we, at 20, 30 minutes, get another blood gas and have somebody kind of looking at the patient and making sure that they're actually okay. Okay, case number three. Same thing. Bedside, eight year old man, can't breathe. You enter the room, he's in distress, speaking short sentences to you. But this guy was admitted with a hip fracture. They're diaphoretic, tachypnic, their lungs are clear, and they're tachycardic. Their SATs are 85 on two liters, but their blood pressure is only 90 over 60. So, what do you do? What's your top of your differential for this person? <coughs> Or pulmonary embolism, yes, yeah, some type of embolism. So again, like, what do you do? They're hypoxic, put them on supplemental oxygen, right? Um, when you examine them, their lungs are clear, their belly's soft, they're tachycardic and tachypnic, they have a little bit of edema. Um, for that relative hypotension, you should give them some fluid. Um, and this is a case where you would you know, probably start, maybe start with just getting a chest X-ray and a, a gas. So your blood gas, it's 752, 25, 95 on 100% non injury What's your PF ratio there? You guys know what the PF ratio is? So your PF ratio, we talk about this in the unit all the time, will be what your PO2 is over how much supplemental oxygen you want. <clears throat> so it's really easy when I'm on 100%. It's just whatever your PO2 is. So his PF ratio is 95, which is really bad. Um, the x-ray looks clear. So now your your initial thought was, I'm concerned about a pulmonary embolism. Your thought, ooh, this goes much, much higher now, right? So what do you do? What do you order? Yeah, CT chest. So you do it, and then he's got this. So you guys see the, that's your main pulmonary artery dividing into your right and your left, and you got a nice big saddle embolism sitting there. So <clears throat> just a Quick thing about like the saddle pulmonary emboli, just pulmonary emboli in general. If they're stable, right, everything is all about what's the hemodynamic stability. So if they're stable, um, most people will just get anticoagulation with heparin, and that should be fine. Um, if they're crashing, hypotensive, looks like they're going to code, what do you do? Hmm? TPA. TPA, do you guys know how much? So it depends on you know how urgently you need to push it. It's weight based. Um, if the easiest way I think about it is that if they look like a normal sized person, 100 milligrams. If they're really small, cut it in half. It's 50. Um, if it's in a code or like a pericode situation, <clears throat> let's say they're a normal sized person, you know, like an eight year old guy with a fracture, um, you'd push 50, and the other 50 you infuse over two hours. Um, if they're in between, have you guys heard of this whole ECOS guided lysis? Mm -hmm. and you guys have the lysis in the unit. Like, we get patients like that all the time. But, so now, you know, it, there's this new thing. And again, to be honest, the, there's not a lot of data to tell us whether or not is this the right thing to be doing. Or not. But for people who have a significant amount of clot burden, especially if there's signs of RV strain. So one of the things that if you find somebody who's got a pulmonary embolism, um, we always want to make sure we try to get an echo done as soon as possible to look for RV strain. We can think about doing uh, lower extremity dopplers to see if there's still a residual clot there. And you also want to check some blood work, do a plasma BNP and troponins. All of those help to give us an idea about is there strain on the right ventricle. Um, because even if they are still hemodynamically maybe a little tacky, but their blood pressure is okay, if there's a significant amount of RV strain, remember it's all plummet. It's a big tube, and there's a clog in the system, things back up. That's how I explain it to patients all the time. Um, if there's a significant amount of RV strain and a lot of central clot, <clears throat> we do this, the vascular surgeons here will do this thing called ECOS-guided lysis. And so they put these two catheters in the groin, 
swim up these little catheters that go into the pulmonary artery and infuse much lower doses of TPA directly onto the clot. Um, so in theory, it sounds pretty good. Usually it's pretty good. Um, so you get to use a lot less TPA. You just dissolve the clot immediately. Um, you have less risk of bleeding than when you push 100 of TPA, and, and when you're doing this kind of low dose infusion of the, the TPA directly onto the clot. Um, and in, in we see, you know, just this is just from experience. You see people, you know, their RV function gets better very quickly. Um, what we don't really know for sure, just to be honest and frank about it, is that we don't know is this really better than just having this. You know, these people who are relatively stable, who just have a crappy looking RV, if you just heparinize, the majority of people who you heparinize, all their clot goes away eventually, right? And where the heparin doesn't necessarily dissolve the clot, right? There's two systems in your body, a system that makes clot and a system that dissolves clot. If you have a pulmonary embolism, your system that makes the clot is too revved up. Your system that dissolves clot should be functioning fine. And so the heparin helps to prevent more clot from sticking on and forming and allows your dissolving system to do its job. So the majority of people who have blood clots, even a lot of clot, if you heparinize them, they're fine. You don't usually do it, but if you repeat it, their scans, all their clots gone. So we don't know for sure if ECOS really is better or not, but there's this percentage of patients who have a significant amount of pulmonary emboli who go on to develop pulmonary hypertension and who are debilitated for the rest of their life. And so the idea behind ECOS is to try to not have those people. So the treatment can't be based on the size of the clot that they see? It's based on kind of the size of the clot and how much strain there is. Yeah. Because sometimes you see people who look like they got a ton of clot, but they're not tachycardic, on room air, blood pressure's fine, no RV strain. I would just anticoagulate that patient. <clears throat> so it really isn't a patient who has signs of RV strain. Um, do you know how you can tell, looking at a CAT scan, if somebody has RV strain? Yeah, so you can take a look at the size on the CAT scan of the right ventricle versus the left ventricle. And our radiologists will actually just tell you <laughs> what the RV to LV ratio is. If it's a pulmonary embolism, they're going to say that the RV to LV ratio is 1 or 1.5. Those are bad. The RV is supposed to be much smaller than the left ventricle. Okay, okay. <clears throat> same thing. 80-year-old man, can't breathe, in distress, talking short sentences. So this guy was admitted with cellulitis. <clears throat> um, when you examine him, he's diaphoretic, tachypnic, his lungs are clear, he's tachycardic, his belly's kind of rigid and tender. Um, his sat is 92% on two liters, his blood pressure is 90 over 60. So what do you do for him? Hmm? Okay, so fluids for the blood pressure. To make sure what kind of antibiotic is wrong. Okay. Well, what do we think is wrong? Is he frigid? He's frigid, tender with guarding, right? So he may have been here for cellulitis, but it seems like something else is happening. So you roll hypoxia, you put him on oxygen, you check his gas. Ooh, and remember now, when you do blood gases, right? All these patients, when you're on a knife boat, when you see somebody with shorter breath, you kind of figure out what's wrong. Make sure you order the ABG with the lights and lactate, okay? There's two different orders that you can choose. You can get the gas with the lactate now anywhere in the hospital. So make sure you choose that on, on lights and you're trying to figure out why you're sure about It's so helpful to have the lactate when you do the blood gas also. So this guy's got a lactate of nine. He's got a tender, rigid abdomen. So what do you need to do? Yeah. yeah. So you'll call surgery, and at the same time, you get a CAT scan. So what does that show? Yeah, it's all free air, right? Yeah, so he needs to go to the operating room, uh, go for surgery. Same thing. So the, the reason I had the exact same patient, right, is that based on kind of why they came and what their exam is, it's totally different things that explanations for why they're short of breath. So that was the whole point that I kind of did it like this, uh, is that, again, like you have to think about why are they here, and then base your exam and try to figure out what's my differential, what's at the top. Um, and if, if people can look, the same thing can present in multiple different ways. Well, they present the same way and it's a lot of different things. It's actually the opposite of what I just said. Okay, so case number five. This one's admitted with pneumonia, the diaphoretic, tachypnic, 
Roncaris, and Junkie bilaterally. Um, I guess I already put them on a non read reader. The 86 on a non read reader, but pressure's 80 over 60. That guy sucked. <laughs> this one is just septic. So you do a blood gas, oh, 7.196975 on 100%. The left is four. So you can think about BiPAP, but you always have to remember, right? So BiPAP, a couple of things. We always talk about what people's mental status is, right? And that if their mental status isn't good, that we shouldn't try BiPAP. Okay. We might have a little court with that. We put BiPAP on people all the time who have no mental status, right? All the time we do it. Patient who's hypercaptic, who's completely attended, what do we do? We put them on BiPAP. <laughs> so even though that's like a thing that we always talk about, and we, when you're in med school, you hear or will say that if they don't have a good mental status, you shouldn't put them on BiPAP. We put lots of people who have low cash mental status on BiPAP. Sometimes they're DNR, DNI, and that's our only option that we have. Um, and sometimes we think that it's something that we can reverse quickly with the BiPAP, and then go ahead and try the BiPAP and see. Um, <clears throat> you know, if they have a ton of secretions, that may not be. The, the right thing to do, they can plug and just code. Um, the other part that I think is also really helpful when you're, when you're trying to figure out is BiPAP a good option right now, is do I think that whatever is going on is going to be rapidly reversible or not, right? So pulmonary edema, try BiPAP, decrease preload, push Lasix, they get better, they come off. COPD, they're wheezing a ton, put them on BiPAP, give them their bronchodilators, give them a little bit of time, and so they can come back off. This guy's here with multi-lobar pneumonia, who sounds like he's just going into septic shock. Right? He's got a lactate, he's hypotensive, he's hypoxic. You can try BiPAP, but it's not gonna work. This one's gonna get intubated. So how do you get, get somebody intubated? You guys know? Anybody going over there? We call you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you can call. So let's say you get called. So you would tell the nurses to call rapid response. So rapid response um, will help to kind of monitor the patient in this kind of their fashion will need help. Um, you can call the ICU team. So if somebody's going to intubate, 2170. So your main job is to call everybody, call rapid response, call respiratory to bring a vent, call anesthesia, call the ICU. So you make all those phone calls. And now you're just standing there, <laughs> right? With this patient who's like gurgling on secretions and huffing and puffing. So what can the things that you can do while you're waiting for those people to show up, right? So get the code card, get the nurses to bring the code card in the room, get the patient on the monitor, um, have them bring the intubation box and the intubation medications, um, set up suction. So when they're going to intubate somebody, especially when he's gurgling away on all of the secretions, they're going to need to suction everything and stay sedated to tube uh, And always get a bag of normal saline hooked up. I don't care if you think he's in pulmonary edema or not. Get a bag of saline, wide open. Not through the pump, wide open, going through a good IV. Make sure you got a good IV. Um, and then anesthesia will show up and they'll put the tube in. Anesthesia will always ask you, what is their renal function? What is their potassium? Why do they care? Why? Because of the anesthetic drugs that cause. Which one? What's the one drug? Suctional uh, Yeah. So they want to know what the potassium is and what the renal function is, because if the K is seven, you're not going to give sucks. Um, you can give rock, you can give decaronium, but you're not going to give sucks to that patient. So they're always going to ask you, so you might as well, while you're standing there waiting for somebody to come help you, um, just take a look at the labs and see what it is. Okay, six. Call by a nurse. The patient is sitting in a pool of blood. This took forever to find a good picture for this. So difficult. Okay. Uh, so step one, right? Evaluate the patient, figure out what their hemodynamic stability is. You give them fluids if they're hypertensive. Um, and then you're going to type in cross at least two units of blood. Um, you check your IV access. So what do you want? What's large bore? Yeah, 16, 18, 24 gauge, that's, that's pediatric IV. It's garbage. Okay. Um, is it better, let's say they're having some trouble f putting an IV in. What type of line should you put in there? Hmm? If they do an IO, what kind of central line? <laughs> line? So it's not a triple D. 
So why is, what's better? Let's say they have a central line and they have an 18 oh, gauge ID. Really, really bad. Yeah. Yeah. But why, so what, um, why, is, why is it better? Let's say the patient is sitting on the floor and they have a triple lumen in their neck and an 18 gauge ID here. So where are you gonna put the blood through? Which one? 18. Why? Yeah. Hmm? The diameter. And light, right? Just remember, what is it, Pus Pusel? 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 right? So the long, it's a the central line, you think that's a great line, right? But it's long, so a long line. So the holes, I think, in the central line are, six, are two 18s and a 20, I think, the actual yeah. diameter of the, the holes in each of the ports. Um, but it's long, so there's a lot of resistance. So you can push 250 cc's of blood through that 18 gauge ID a heck of a lot faster than you can through a central line. If you have no ID access, then you put a cord in, so an introducer. So an introducer is like my pinky. So it's not that long, a little fat. Goes in a, a femoral vein, or your bladder, wherever you can. Um, and that you can pour blood. It's so important. <laughs> I love bleeders. Those are my favorite patients. <laughs> You'll see when you're in the unit because they all love bleeders. Um, you can just pour blood in those patients. We do have this thing called a rapid infuser. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, you have to get it from the SICU. So if you really have somebody that's pouring out blood, like a good cirrhotic, who's having a nice, very seal bleed and filling up the bed, um, those patients, we'll talk about what we put them on. That's where, where this part comes in. The history and exam will help you figure out what you need to order for this patient. Uh, if it's melana, <clears throat> it's more likely upper, so at least start them on a protonic strip, so bolus and start the infusion. If they have liver disease, if it's a good cirrhotic, you also want to put them on octreotide. Um, if it's bright red blood per rectum, it's most likely lower, but it could be a really fast upper, so you still do the PPI drip and still think about octreotide. Um, you're going to call GI, really, please. Let's go to this patient. And then they're going to say, no, we'll do it in your state. And you, which is always happens. Um, OK, case number seven. So now, now we're going to do a little bit different. So call by the nursing staff to evaluate a patient who isn't acting right. So on arrival, they appear sleepy. They arouse, but then they fall asleep again quickly. Uh, their pupils are reacted bilaterally. Their lungs are diminished. Soft abdomen, moving all extremities. What would be a good initial step? So uh, you do the blood gas. I like the blood gas. So blood gas is faster than doing a CT. Okay? So you can at least get a result on a blood gas pretty quick. So they seem like they're, they're moving everything. Their pupils are reactive. You know, the, the likelihood of it being, if they're moving both sides, they wake up and they can kind of mumble some stuff and make some sense. You know, my suspicion for something devastating in terms of the head is a little bit less. Um, I'm more concerned about a metabolic issue. And the most rapid, the most common metabolic issue that makes people sleepy in the hospital, um, maybe it's medication. So you think about whether or not they've got new drugs and stuff. But um, also, you know, just see if they're hypercapnic. So you do a blood gas, they're hypercapnic, you put them on BiPAP, give them some treatments, do repeat the gas, and their gas is much better. That's an easy one. Um, so now let's see a different person. He's called by a nursing staff to evaluate a patient who isn't uh, acting right. That's right. Yeah. Um, the, when you first see them, they're sleepy, they arouse, when they fall asleep again, their pupils are reactive, they're moving everything. <clears throat> you do a gas on this one, not hypercapnic. Ah. Get a head CT. What's that? That's a big bleed. That's a big bleed, right? A lot of blood. So you contact neurosurgery. If you see blood in the head, you're going to call neurosurgery for urgent evaluation. But no. <laughs> they come back from the CT and they're not responding. So you evaluate the patient, they're sonorous, they're not responsive. It's the best I can find for you. Look at their pupils. That's not good, right? Mm -hmm. So what now? Okay, so what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you said it. So what's the problem? What's happening? Uh, they're hernia. Yep. So there's increased intracranial pressure. 
So this is one of my favorite things. I love this. Um, so what in God's name do we do? <laughs> Let's say it's a 30-year-old girl. All of a sudden, blood in her head. She's hurting you. What can we do? Because there are things that we can do to try to save her life. Two person So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So our, the name of the game right now is you are on. This is like the your highest pressure moments right now. Like there are, you have minutes to go before the other people start to dilate, which is so you care, you know what's wrong. By chance, had a heads into you. But even regardless, if you see somebody who, if you walked in, the first thing that you saw when you saw this person was that their pupil was blown, most people will say, oh, let's send them for a head CT. That's the wrong answer. You know what's wrong if they've blown a pupil and they're not responsible. They have increased intracranial pressure. So what are the things that we can do to try to reduce intracranial pressure immediately? You tell them that all the so mannitol is one thing, right? So the first thing would be, to remember, they're totally unresponsive and just sonorous. So intubate the patient. So call anesthesia, intubate the patient. And then once they're intubated, you bag the crap out of them, okay? So what is that going to do? What is hyperventilating the patient going to do? Right? So you blow down your PCO2, you vasoconstrict. Because remember, within your skull, there's three things. There's brain, there's blood, there's CSF. We can't do anything about the brain part, unless you pre in a prior life or a neurosurgeon and you know how to take off somebody's skull. You can't do anything about that. Um, the CSF, this is not the time to try doing a lumbar puncture. That is not going to help us right now. Um, so we can do try to deal with the blood part of this, right? So you hyperventilate them, bag, and this is not just put them on the vent and turn the weight up to 20. It's like you are bagging the shit out of them, trying to get the PCO2 down as fast as you can. Um, mannitol. <clears throat> so if they're a big person, it's the same kind of stuff as a TPA. Big person, push 100 of mannitol. Smaller person, maybe do 50 of mannitol. Um, but you just push. So what is that going to do? What does mannitol do? Osmotic diuresis, right? So we're just going to get them to pee out fluids and try, again, try to just shrink whatever, give whatever volume it can out of their head out. Then somebody said 2% saline. I can totally say that, right? So <clears throat> That is the answer, but hypertonic saline is the answer, but not two or three percent saline, because it takes too long. Right? You start somebody on two percent or three percent saline. You check the chemistry again in four hours. You're checking in on a dead person. Right? It's, it takes too long for it to work. So it's my favorite thing. So it's that you have to get help from the universe. You, you need a central line. So you put a central line in. And what you can get is you can get a thirty cc. 30 cc syringe of 23.7% saline. Where do we get this? Oh, I had the cold bars. It's Sean, give me the stick. <laughs> so it's a 30 cc of 23.7% saline. So that's really salty fluid. You have to push it through a central line over like two, three minutes, um, but that will rapidly raise your serum sodium by a couple of points to try to, again, help with any of you. So my favorite case in the whole career so far. You did. Yeah, I did this. So we had a 30-year-old girl who came in with strep meningitis. She was at Kalahari with her kids, came in completely altered, and then became less and less responsive. Uh, went for her head CT. It wasn't a bleed. It was that she was developing tons of cerebral edema. And then she did exactly this. Right pupil blown. So we intubated her. Um, push the mannitol. <clears throat> Even after the mannitol, I put the central line in. The other people became blown also. We called neurosurgery. Neurology was here. Neuro was like, I think she's gone. She's like, this is terrible. She's gone. Like her husband and her mom were outside, hysterical. So then I pushed the 30 cc's of 23.7, and then her pupils shrunk back down. It became a lot. And then right then is when the neurosurgeon, Dr. Lee, walked in and was like, the pupils were blown before, and now they're reactive. You got ocular cephalix back? He was like, yeah. So he took her for a, a hemicranium. Took off half her skull. Um, she had a bunch of stuff happen. She ended up having a, needing a trach. And, but she's now home with her kids. She's on the vent just at night. Otherwise, she's off the vent. She's walking, talking, 
perfectly fine. And we just made an appointment to put our skull back on. So this stuff actually, it happens very rarely, but it does work. Uh, so it's, it's what, this is my favorite case. I told Dr. Zakula, he's like, I have to put it on. <laughs> They don't scare people. I'm like, no, that's so good. It's like the one time you can really save someone. It's really good. You got to know it. <laughs> okay, so my summary is pretty good. Okay, don't panic. There's plenty of people here to help you. Okay, APMs are here all the time. There's an ICU attending in house. I sleep here two or three times a month. You know, there's, we're around. We do in house calls. There's a fellow in house. The APMs are here. There's a ton of people around. Uh, try to keep yourself structured, okay? Try to do the same thing every time you see, you get a call and you sound like they're kind of sick. Take a quick look at the chart, go and see the patient. What do I think is happening? Get an initial idea, figure out what do I need to do to try to manage them, stabilize them, how do I monitor them, and then figure out what tests we need to do. Um, what they came in for is usually what's making them sick. Don't be completely beholden to that, but that'll help you most of the Remember this kind of picture and this kind of template of that structure of how do I evaluate somebody when they're sick? And that's it. Any questions? The ICU is the best. You guys want to call me the happiest place in the world.